I want to um, ask everybody a question, a couple of questions, in fact. I want you to think about two things during this talk. Uh, the first one is um, why do low carbs work for weight loss? Because I'm going to give you a really concrete reason that you've probably never heard before. So think about why low carb diets work for weight loss. And also, the other question is, when you lose weight on a low carb diet, or when you lose weight on any kind of a diet for that matter, where does it go? So ponder, <laughs> ponder those questions while we, while we move along. Oh, and, uh, and I hate to go to these meetings because I'm so busy. I can't listen because I'm scribbling down citations. So I've put all these citations on my website. It's proteinpower.com front slash low carb USA Boca. So don't bother trying to copy anything down. It'll all be there. There's even a little video included in this, and, and the, the video is going to be on there too. So this all started, my, my thought process on this started back in, night in 2007. Back in the early 2000s, about 20 years ago, not quite 20 years ago, I decided for whatever reason to start blogging about low-carb issues. And one day in, in September of 2007, I was, you know, plodding along through my meaningless, pitiful life, and all of a sudden, I was embroiled in this huge internet controversy. And it, in the grand scheme of things, it was just a tempest in a teapot, but when you're in the middle of the tempest in the teapot, it's a huge deal. And I had written this, this post as a calorie, always a calorie. And somebody that had a popular website at the time who will remain unnamed, uh, attacked me over it, and somebody said something to me in the comments about it, and I answered him back and said, well, I think he's wrong, and that fired him off. And the next thing I knew, he had published a 50-page book on why I was an idiot. And not only why I was an idiot, why Richard Feynman, who's a biochemist, and, and Gene Fine, both of whom wrote a... a, a a paper on the thermodynamics of low-carb diets, and Gary Talms, who's a good friend of mine, they were all idiots. And the guy admitted that he had never read Gary's book, but just associating with me was enough to make him an idiot. <laughs> so I got into this big deal with this guy, and it was all over this blog post. And so this is really what got me thinking about this, because I didn't think about it when I wrote the blog post. And this blog post was about the, uh, uh, the Ansel Keys starvation study in Minnesota. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. And it started out, he had recruited 37, I think, conscientious objectors, gave them 12 weeks of a um, um, really a normal diet, their typical diet, and then put them on a 24-week starvation diet. And after the 24-week starvation diet, they went from looking like this, this one guy when he came in, to looking like that 24 weeks later. And they all looked like that. Uh, they were all skin and bones. They had uh, all kinds of problems. They slept all the time. They were lethargic. They obsessed on food. They developed psychiatric disorders. Some of them resorted to self-harm. It was a miserable experience for them. And they were kept under lock and key. So this was, you know, a good study. Would never make it through an institutional review board today. But anyway, we've got, we got a lot of good data from that study. But what I wrote about this study, other than just describing it, I had just read a study by John Yudkin, who is a hero of mine, and he had, uh, he had recruited a few students and some faculty members at the college where, where he was in London, and he wanted to see what um, um, the nutritional adequacy of a low-carb diet was, because people back then, this was in the 50s, well, he wrote this paper in the 70s, but back in the 50s and 60s, there were a lot of people going on low-carb diets, and people were saying, well, it's nutritionally inadequate, so he wanted to see what it was, if it was nutritionally inadequate. So he told these people all about how to do a low-carb diet and just left them to their own devices, and they kept food diaries. And what ended up happening, and this is the paper, and what ended up happening is that uh, they started out with 2,330 calories, and they spontaneously reduced their caloric intake to 1,560 calories. And if you look at the diet that, that Ansel Keys put these poor guys on who starved, they were on a 1,570-calorie diet, but it was a high-carb, low-fat diet. They actually had a little bit more protein on the Yudkin diet. And so 
the same diet that these guys starved on, the Yudkin people, who were also young and not really obese, they spontaneously restricted their calories to a little bit lower than that and did fine. And that was the whole deal of my calorie, is a calorie really a calorie? And which set this guy off and started this whole thing and started me thinking about it all. And when I wrote back about this, because one of the things that came up was this concept of a metabolic advantage. And what I wrote about this is I said, you know, the metabolic advantage is at the max about 300 kcals per day. Now, the, uh, that, this was all in 2007. Now, in 2012, uh, David Ludwig's group did a really intensive study on a bunch of people. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details on the study because this is just a lead up to what I really want to talk about. And when he did this, uh, they found that, uh, lo and behold, the total energy expenditure differed by approximately 300 calories per day. So it, uh, it kind of confirmed what I had guessed at uh, in terms of this so-called metabolic advantage. And I want to talk about the metabolic advantage because it used to appear in all kinds of papers and it's kind of antiquated now because what we really are talking about is increased energy expenditure. If you're on a 2,000 calorie diet and it makes you expend 2,200 or 2,300 calories, then you got a 300 kcal uh, increased energy expenditure from the diet. And that is the cause, the metabolic advantage is the result. So when you hear metabolic advantage, just think increased energy expenditure. Now, everybody talks about the, when they talk about diets and calories, they talk about the first law of thermodynamics. Now here's what Gary had to say about it in Good Calories, Bad Calories. Is this conviction that positive caloric balance causes weight gain is founded on the belief that this proposition is an incontrovertible implication of the first law of thermodynamics. And it's basically calories in versus calories out. The Keiko guys. Now, when you, this is a metabolic chamber, and what happens in a metabolic chamber, because this is the way you measure increased energy uh, or total energy expenditure, you've got to look at the decrease in oxygen, the increase in CO2, which is a combustion product, put it through all these equations, and bingo, you come out with it. And this is what a metabolic chamber looks like, so you're going to see that this is an expensive proposition to put people in metabolic chambers, which is why they don't use them a whole lot, because they are really pricey. Another thing that's really pricey is doubly labeled water, which is another way to determine increased energy expenditure. And all the people that we're, I'm going to talk about who are the Kaiko team all think that, that doubly labeled water is the gold standard, and I've heard them say it in talks. It's the gold standard for measuring energy expenditure, but it too is expensive. When Lifson came up, Nathan Lifson from University of Minnesota came up with it back in the late 1940s to do it on, he didn't do it on people, he did it on mice, but if he did it on people, it would have cost about $250,000 an experiment, and now it's down to about 600 bucks, so it's more reasonable, but they're still expensive, which is why people don't use them that often. So anyway, in, in 2016, Kevin Hall and his group did this big study that sort of kicked off this whole calories in calories out versus the carbohydrate insulin model you all know what the carbohydrate insulin model is right more or less okay this kicked off this this real debate about it and what what they found in this study was that uh, and, and what they did is they put people on what they call the basic diet, the BD, which was a, a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. It was 300 grams of carbohydrate a day and 30 grams of fat and 91 grams of protein. And the people on the ketogenic diet were on 30 grams of carbohydrate a day uh, and I think 225 grams of fat. I can't remember exactly. But anyway, they did this in a metabolic chamber and they did doubly labeled water. And they put them in there. They put them, which I think is kind of unfair. They put them on the baseline diet, the high-carbohydrate diet, first for two weeks. Then they followed up with two weeks uh, on the ketogenic diet with them having the same amount of time on the metabolic chamber two days at a time every week on all four weeks in the doubly labeled water the last two weeks of the experiment. And, the, um, and, and what they came up with on this uh, is that compared with the basic diet, the ketogenic diet, coincided with an increased energy expenditure of 57 calories a day, kcals a day, and 89 calories during sleep, and, and 151 calories 
using doubly labeled water. And they, and all these people that had gone around promoting doubly labeled water and saying that it was the gold standard, now said, well, it's not as good in this study as the metabolic chamber because it, it came out higher, of course. And then they said the 57 is it's just an artifact. So it really is zero increased energy expenditure. It really is all just calories in and calories out. And subsequent to that, there have been just paper after paper after paper from both of these groups. And every time a paper comes out, the other group attacks it. And then the next group writes a paper, and then the other group attacks it, and it's just going down the pathway of attacking, attacking, attacking. And what has ended up happening is that the calories in, calories out guys have got this down to where there really is very little difference between the two of them but in terms of excess energy expenditure. But what the interesting part of it is, is even the calories in, calories out people say that low carbohydrate diets are good for people who have metabolic issues, who have you know type two diabetes, who have high triglycerides, low HDL, who have you know all the things that go along with the uh, the metabolic disease or syndrome that um, Ben talked about this morning. Uh, but anyway, as all theories do. They all became more and more complex over time. And this is the calories in, calories out model. It used to just be calories in versus calorie out. Now it's this whole, you know, giant long algorithm kind of a thing. And not to be outdone, the carbide insulin model people did the same thing. They have this elaborate description uh, of how this all works. And recently, uh, David Ludwig came up with a paper that was really pretty good because it simplified these uh, a lot. And he shows that the energy balance model, and essentially the energy balance model says, which is the calories in, calories out, says that we're awash in a sea of processed foods, um, high caloric uh, intensity foods or density foods. And because we're in this, we can't resist. And so we eat. And when we eat, we go into positive energy balance. And the uh, because we've got all the, the reward from eating this food, we go into positive energy balance. That sends up uh, these all these circulating fuels in our, our blood, which end up going into adipose tissue for storage. The carbohydrate insulin model says the primary drivers are a high glycemic load or a high carb diet. The high carb diet acting through insulin, through GIP and GLP-1, but mainly GIP, I would say, increase adipose tissue storage. It sucks uh, nutrients out of the bloodstream. The brain reads that as, hey, I'm hungry, and so we eat more and that gives us a positive energy balance because we're in this cycle. And that's the carbohydrate uh, energy model. Now, the fly in the ointment with this is even though they've gotten the excess energy expenditure down to almost zero in this fighting back and forth, and they even won't let it go with that, and it goes on and on and on. But anyway, the, uh, the fact is that whenever low-carb diets are studied, they always do better than high-carb diets irrespective of what this energy expenditure difference is that everybody's fighting over. And the public health collaboration, which I know some other people have talked about in the UK, has done, uh, they've, uh, they've tallied up, I think, 67 studies that fit their parameters of a low-carb diet, of duration and subjects and all this, of low-carb diets versus low-fat diets in terms of weight loss. And when you look at that, you find out that they've got, yeah, 67 studies. And what you see on this is that 58 of the 67, the low-carb diets lost more than the low-fat. And in 37 of the 67, the low-carb diets showed significant weight loss as compared to low-fat. And on the low-fat diets, none of them showed significant weight loss. So irrespective of what they're doing with all this metabolic chamber stuff and the energy in and energy out, in the real world, when you compare low-carb diets to low-fat diets, the low-carb diets generally triumph. Now, let's go back to this, uh, this picture from Dr. Ludwig's slide, or his uh, article. And this is the important part because the figures here, and the figure says the first law of thermodynamics dictates that a positive energy balance must exist as body energy stores increase. Okay, so that's the first law of thermodynamics. And what they've done is this is what the Kaiko folks use, the first law of thermodynamics, because energy can either be created or destroyed. So it's a conservation of energy uh, equation. And they um, uh, are using that, and they have 
conned the carbohydrate insulin, insulin metabolism people, or carbohydrate insulin model people into using it too. And it's the wrong paradigm. And what I want to talk about is what I see as the right paradigm, um, but I think it's the wrong paradigm, but everybody insists on using this first law of thermodynamics. So uh, if, if you look at the, the, again, from Gary's book, the fact remains that no matter what people eat, it's calories that ultimately count. Eat more calories than your body uses, and you'll gain weight. Eat fewer calories, and you'll lose weight, said Jane Brody from the New York Times and uh, the mistress of idiocy. Uh, let me state that we have implicit faith in the validity of the first law of thermodynamics. A calorie is a calorie. Calories in equals calories out. That's Dr. John Taggart. He was the head of the physiology department at Columbia University. And this is what he said, according to Gary quoted him, he said this at an obesity conference uh, years ago. Now, what Gary says, here's the, here the context is the first law of thermodynamics, the law of en energy conservation. This law says that energy is neither created nor destroyed, and so the calories we consume will be either stored, expended, or excreted. This in turn applies, and this part in yellow is, is important. Any change in body weight must equal the difference between the calories we consume and the calories we expend, and thus the positive or negative energy balance. Change in energy stores equals energy intake minus energy expenditure. A delta weight loss, the difference in weight loss, equals kcals in minus kcals out. Now, the way that this is usually thought of, it runs in this direction. And if you eat a lot, your kcals go up. And if you don't exercise, your kcals out go down and your weight goes up. And Gary and good calories, bad calories, posited that the opposite could happen, uh, which he kind of got from uh, Pennington, which we'll talk about in a minute. Anyway, that if your weight loss goes up, that can make you eat more calories and make your exercise uh, go down. So what would be a condition that would cause this, do you think? Why would your weight going up cause your calorie increase to go up and your, your um, output to go down? Well, here's one example. This is a teenage kid. I don't know how many of you have had teenagers, but they eat like hogs and they sleep all the time. And what's happening is they're converting, they're growing. And when they grow, they're increasing their weight. And so to, to keep up with this increase in weight, they've got to eat more and they exercise less. And yet they don't get fat because all of this, all of this um, energy uh, caloric energy is going into building body structures. So that's your, where you've got the energy coming in minus the energy going out. And that's a classic case. If you've got a metabolic defect, the same thing can happen. If you're sensitive to carbs, you eat carbs and you can do this carbohydrate insulin model where you're sucking all the, the fat into your adipose tissue, it makes you hungry and you continue to eat more and are probably lethargic. Now, I want to shift to the real subject that I want to talk about. And this is pretty basic, but just so we're all on the same page, what's a calorie? A calorie is the amount of heat it takes to raise one gram of water, one centigrade. So one gram of water is one cc. Uh, and that's what's called a little calorie, a little c calorie. A big c calorie, which is a kcal, which is what we use in nutrition, is the amount of heat it takes to raise one liter of water, one degree centigrade. Now, a liter of water weighs a kilogram. So let's do a thought experiment here. We got a really accurate kitchen scale. We're sitting around one day with nothing to do. And we take a liter of water at 100 degrees. It's fresh off the boil. We pour it into a, uh, a thin wall, stainless steel cylinder. We cap it off so there could be no evaporation. We set it on the scale, and it's a, it's a gram. We've already zeroed out the, the bottle. So it's a gram. And we're, so water weighs a kilogram. We're in a room that's 20 C, 20 degrees C. And we go away and, and do something. And we come back six hours later. And now the water has assumed room temperature. It's 20 degrees C. Okay. The water still weighs a kilogram. It hasn't changed. But it lost 80 calories. So if you look at it from this perspective, we're 80 calories down, but the weight hasn't changed because heat doesn't weigh. Energy doesn't weigh. You cannot weigh energy. And 
So it's idiocy to talk about the first law of thermodynamics and compare weight that you get on a scale to compare mass to energy. All right? Does everybody kind of follow me on this? Okay, because you can't weigh calories. Now, and so the weight is, is zero. So the first law, is it the first law of thermodynamics we should be dealing with? No, not really. Not, not in my opinion. Now, this guy is one of my heroes, this guy named uh, Max Kleiber. He came up with the Kleiber line, and I talk about it in another talk. But this is his book, The Fire of Life. And I just checked before I came up here, and you can go on Amazon and get you a copy for 273 bucks. Fortunately, I got mine about 25 years ago at the suggestion of Jules Hirsch, who told me about it. Uh, Jules Hirsch is an old-time obesity researcher. And anyway, what Kleiber says is forming hypothesis is one of the most precious faculties of the human mind that is necessary for the development of science. Sometimes, however, hypotheses grow like weeds and lead to confusion instead of clarification. Think about those diagrams I showed you of how calories in, calories out have expanded and the carbohydrate insulin model has expanded. Uh, they, they, so that the operational concepts can, you know, so one has to clear the field so that the operational concepts can grow and function. Concepts should relate as directly as possible to observation, measurements, and blah, blah, blah. And then we've got Albert, uh, Alfred Pennington that I mentioned a little bit ago. And Pennington is sort of a pivotal character. You may never have heard of him, but he's a pivotal character in l low carbery because Pennington learned about low carb from Blake Donaldson, who was an old time New York doctor who used to put people on carnivore diets. And he learned about low carb and carnivore diets from Wilhelmer Stephenson. So you've got that connection with Pennington. And then Pennington was the guy who taught Robert Atkins the Atkins diet. Okay, as he picked that up from work with Pennington. So Pennington says, and I love this quote because it happened to me. Says the concept, and here he's talking sort of about the carbohydrate insulin model. So the concept dawned on me with such clarity that I felt stupid for having not seen it before. And he said once he realizes that frustrating incongruities resolve themselves into a consistent pattern, everything fitted together like clockwork. That's exactly what happened to me when it dawned on me what I think the real reason is for weight loss and low-carb diets. Now, back in 2014, these two guys, uh, Meerman and Brown, who are Australians, wrote this paper uh, called, When Somebody Loses Weight, Where Does the Fat Go? And I didn't get this paper until about two years after it was written. And once I read it, I began to obsess on it. And I kept thinking about, oops, excuse me, I kept thinking about this a lot in terms of low-carb diets. And when I, um, when I got it, I, I looked up these guys on PubMed to see if they had anything else published on this, and they didn't. And I thought, wow, that's weird to come up with it, because they were writing about different stuff. So it's weird to come up with a paper like this, and you don't have any other literature on it. So I, I looked around a little bit, and I Googled Ruben Meerman, the lead guy, and lo and behold, he's got a TED Talk. I thought, oh, okay, a TED Talk. Maybe that'll be enlightening. So I got the TED Talk, and I watched it. And it was, it was very good, and I've got a little excerpt of it that's a, sort of the core piece of this TED Talk. Now, you got to know that when you watch this, I want you to think, because when I decided to do this talk originally, I thought, I'm going to gather all this stuff and do this demonstration up on the stage. And I thought about that for about 30 seconds, and I talked to my wife about it, and she said, put it on the video. So anyway, you'll see the video, and you can imagine me up here doing this. So let's watch this short little video. Carbon dioxide and water. So, every time you exhale, out comes a bit of carbon dioxide. You can't see it, this is the problem. This is why people don't know how you lose weight. So there you go, I've trapped some breath, I've inhaled that. 5% of the air in there is now carbon dioxide because uh, it's come out of my lungs. I've got some liquid nitrogen here, and I'm going to use that to freeze this air. Liquid nitrogen is minus 196. It's very handy. Um, where did I? It's right there. In fact, I'll just pour it straight on. So be a little bit careful with this stuff. I use it all the time. If I look a little blasé, I don't mean to. Um, it's please respect this stuff if you play with it the way you would respect boiling hot water. Now, if you pour it onto a balloon, the balloon does not pop, which is 
incredible. The nitrogen's minus 196. Oxygen turns into a liquid at minus 183. So the oxygen in the balloon is turning into liquid. Carbon dioxide turns solid. I've got a big bowl of it there. But it turns solid at minus 78. So in the balloon now, I have frozen, well, I have liquefied oxygen and frozen carbon dioxide. And when I take it out, you'll see them. So it'll just take a while for the balloon to go a little bit clear at the top. The nitrogen in here, air is 79% nitrogen. The nitrogen is in the top of the balloon. But now, look at that liquid down there. Can you see that? That's the oxygen from my breath that I hadn't used. But once it's all gone, there'll be some white powder left. Right, the white powder is breakfast. That's the carbon dioxide, the carbon atoms I ate in the last 24 hours. And when I blow on them, they get warm enough to turn back into gas and they vanish and people think there's nothing in the balloon. The balloon has mass. Those atoms have mass. You can see carbon dioxide has mass when you solidify it, but when you breathe it out, you don't see it. And we've been confusing people by talking about kilojoules or calories, and they're really important. But people do not seem to understand that when you lose weight, you're losing atoms. You can't just turn atoms into nothing. In fact, science teachers out there, you need to change the way you teach chemistry because those people and many in this room think that you can turn atoms into energy. Well, it's one of the founding principles of modern chemistry. You cannot turn an atom into pure energy. It's called the conservation of mass. Okay. Now, in the, in the paper that he wrote, they had gone out and done a survey in Australia. They had, they had questioned five, 50 family doctors, 50 dietitians, and 50 personal trainers. And they said, hey, when someone loses weight, where does all the weight go? Well, it's interesting what they found out because the majority of doctors and the majority of everybody for that matter said that it goes out as energy and heat. You lose weight because you dissipate it as heat. Uh, others, a lot of doctors said others basically because Probably they didn't know what was going on, and so they just said other. Uh, some said feces, especially the trainers. They must have some kind of fixation. The, uh, it be, some said it comes to muscle. Some said it's sweat and urine, which is actually right to a certain extent. Some said they don't know. You notice the doctors, no doctor ever says he doesn't know. So, and then two, two lonely dietitians came up with the right answer. Then it goes out as CO2 and H2O. So that brought me to a great new book that my wife and I are going to write that's called Breathe More and Way Less. Breathe Your Way to Healthy Weight Loss. And that's all you have to do. So now I want to talk about the mass balance equation. And the mass balance equation says mass equals mass in versus minus mass out. So a change in weight is mass in minus mass out. And when I listened to this guy give the whole talk, that's the part you saw, but the rest of the talk, it dawned on me that he had failed to comprehend his own message because he says in there to eat less and exercise more. And that's how you lose weight. The only difference, he said, is you don't dissipate it as heat. You breathe it out as atoms. But he said, eat less and move more. And then he went on in the latter part of the talk saying, don't fall prey to these ketogenic diets and these low-carb diets and these fad diets because they don't work any better than anything else because all you need to do is eat less. Don't get sucked into the, you know, to the ketogenic diet, the low-carb diet, and all that. And so that was his message. And that's when I realized that he didn't really understand. Because what makes the mass? You've got food going in, you've got drink going in, you've got oxygen going in. What comes out is O2, ketones, CO2, feces, methane. Methane comes from burps that are called eructations. It comes from the other end. It's called something else. You've got water, just vapor, urine, sweat, and tears. And all this stuff, except for the oxygen and the CO2, can be weighed, which is a, a pretty low-tech operation. 
Now, you still need to measure the O2 and the CO2, and you need something metabolic chamber-like to do that. But it'd be real easy to measure the mass in versus the mass out, even the insensible water loss. I found a paper on that from back in the 1950s. These guys, two British uh, researchers, went out and they tried to figure out what the insensible losses were for various diets. And they contracted with some company that must have been a famous company because they featured it prominently in the article, the name of it. And they put it, um, they put the beds of their subjects, the scale under the beds of their subjects so that they could measure insensible loss. And this, uh, this scale was accurate to within two grams. And they put these people in bed and they didn't let them get up and they just breathed and they, they laid there and they had a weird way of circulating them in and out so that they could put this together. But it shows that the insensible water was 60, 70 uh, grams per hour on a high fat diet, a little less on a high protein diet and way down at the bottom on a high carbohydrate diet. So you can't even measure insensible weight loss because that included water vapor going out and whatever perspiration that they had that gathered in the bed clothing. So this is the mass balance equation. Now, how much energy do you get in a spoonful of sugar? According to Atwater, who developed all these, you get a teaspoon is five grams of sugar, so the energy in there is 20 calories, okay? Now, if we switch over to Uncle Al, who we saw earlier in this thing, he says that uh, we, he says one teaspoon equals five grams of sugar, too. He also says E equals MC squared. Okay, we're all familiar with that equation, but sometimes we don't know exactly what it means. It means E, in the case of the spoonful of sugar, equals five grams times the speed of light squared. The speed of light squared is a big number. I mean, it's a huge number. So how big is it? Well... The, the bomb that exploded over Nagasaki at the waning days of World War II was 21 kilotons of TNT. A teaspoon of sugar is 107.4 kilotons of TNT. That's a lot of energy. But that's not the energy we get when we eat the sugar. The energy we get comes from breaking the bonds. The energy is released from that. Now, if you look at E equals MC squared and you solve it for mass, and you look at delta mass, the change in mass, the change of energy divided by the speed of light squared, you get the mass is equal to 20 kcal divided by the speed of light squared. Dr. Boswell, I don't know if she's in here, she talked yesterday about doing long division. There's a long division problem for you. <laughs> Divide the, the speed of light, which is 300 kilometers a second, into 20 kcals. And what you find out is that goes to zero or damn near. And so there's no change in energy with a change in, I mean, no change in mass with a change in energy. Now, this is Wilbert Olin Atwater. He's the guy that came up with how many calories are in all these different foods and how much we burn. And he did this back in the late 1800s, and he came up with a proteins, 4 kcals roughly, carbs, 4 kcals per gram, and fat, 9 kcals per gram. And he got in big trouble back then for two reasons. Number one, because he was the first guy to do this in animals, and he did it in humans, and he announced that animals and humans are the same. They've got the same metabolism. You know, the calories work the same with them. And everybody got bent out of shape with him, especially the religious people, because they thought, wait a minute, we're not animals. They're different. We're us. We're divine beings, and they're animals. And so he caught a lot of flack for that. But the thing he really caught the flack for was because he found out that there were calories, usable calories in alcohol. And the temperance movement was huge then, and they came down on him like a load of bricks because – Alcohol was actually a food, and he got involved in the temperance movement and did all his mea culpas, but he got, uh, they got bent out of shape uh, at him for a couple of reasons. So now this is going to be my only tricked-up slide because he would be spinning in his grave with what I'm going to do because this was kind of the insight I had on this thing. If you take the protein and the carbs and the fat and you invert them, instead of 4, grams, four kcals per gram, you get 0.25 grams per kcal. Same with carbs, and fat is 0.11 grams per kcal. Now, you may be able to see where this is going because this is mass in minus mass out. And I call these heavy kcals and light kcals. And it brought to mind another idea for a book that I think we're going to do an homage to our good friend Gary Talbs. <laughs> Uh, 
And so if you, if you look at these things, if you, if you go to the next step and you say, let's assume that an average person consumes 300 kcals a day, and that totals up to a million and 95 kcals a year. Okay, if you take the 90, a million and 95 kcals, how much mass is that? Well, a kcal per carb, 0.25 grams, 100% carbon in the diet, that comes out to be 273 plus grams, 274 kilograms. It comes out to be 603 pounds. Now, this is not just 603 pounds of food. This is 603 pounds of carb. Okay, there's other things in the food, but carb. Even if you, but this is theoretical. It's just another. Um, it's just pure carbs. Now, if you take that same 1,095 or million 95,000 calories, all carbs, 630 pounds of food. If it's 100% fat, it's 0.11 grams per kcal uh, or kcals per gram. You end up with 120.5 kilograms. You end up with 265 pounds. Big difference. 603, 265, the difference of 338 pounds that you're going to eat. And remember, we're looking at mass in versus mass out, not weightless energy in, energy out. So this makes a big difference. Now, that's a theoretical diet. Let's look at a real diet, 2,500 calories a day, low fat, high carb, 55% carb, 30% fat, 15% protein. Here's the low carb, high fat diet, 10% carb. That's 62.5 grams of carb a day. That's in the, kind of the middle, 75% fat. 15% protein, you get 520 grams on the low-fat, high-carb, the low-carb, high-fat, 363 grams. That's 157 grams a day difference. That's about a third of a pound a day. You multiply a little over a third of a pound a day. You multiply that by a week, and you're looking at 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5 .2 a pounds a week. That's about what people lose on low-carb diets. So... It, uh, you know, it calculates out. Now, I kind of got this out of order and turned my slides and I didn't have a chance to get it fixed. And I'm an idiot because I didn't put a legend on it. But it's easy enough to figure out red is protein. Yellow is kind of yellowish like fat. Green is carbs like plants. And we always look at everything by calories. And so you can see wheat flour. Uh, by, these are 100 uh, the same way. So you got wheat flour, you got a ribeye steak, you got 67% of the calories in ribeye, 33% is uh, protein, 67% fat, 85% uh, of, of carb in the wheat flour, 10% uh, protein, and 5% fat. But if you look at them by weight, it's kind of a different picture. If you look at them by weight, the ribeye steak is 54% water. Blue is water. There wasn't water in the last one because it didn't have any calories. 22% fat, 23% protein, and the wheat flour has got 75% uh, carb and only 12% water. So if you're eating a, a low-carb, you know, Melba toast without butter, God help you, diet, or, you know, crackers or all these kind of things, you're not getting very much liquid. You get a lot of liquid in the ribeye steak. And that makes me wonder because we know when people go on low-carb diets, they start peeing a lot. Is it because they're getting the water from the food? I mean, I know that when insulin goes down, you release uh, sodium and you release fluid, but a part of it is probably because they're eating foods that are higher in water content. And I want to do a quick thought experiment, too. Uh, it's kind of like the thermos experiment here. Two guys of equal weight, and you take guy A and guy B, and you put them on diet A and diet B. And the diet A is 200 grams carb, 300, I mean, 200 grams protein, 300 grams carb, 500 grams fat. Okay, that's, that's a lot of food. And diet B, 400 grams protein, 400 grams carb, and 200 grams of fat. You look at that, and that's a kilogram. Each of them eats a kilogram. But this guy's getting 6,500 calories, and this guy's getting 5,000 calories. But they're going to be exactly the same on the uh, scale. This extra 1,500 calories isn't going to be reflected in their weight. So when we're talking about weight loss and low-carb diets, it's mass in minus mass out. And just some final thoughts on this. I got the chamber data from the Kevin Hall study, the, the real the first one that I talked about where they compared the two. And it was this massive spreadsheet with about 30 tabs on it. And it had all kinds of um, 
date on it. And I thought I'm going to be able to go through here and show all this uh, because they had, you know, the oxygen in, the oxygen out, the CO2 out, the ketones out, ketones away. The, they had all this stuff out. But in the chamber stuff, they didn't have the water volume that they had. So, oh, God, I can't do this. So then I looked at the, uh, at the uh, doubly labeled water tab on the spreadsheet and they had a bunch of stuff but they didn't have something else i needed and they didn't have the days matched up so i couldn't use the water intake from the doubly labeled water for a water intake in the chamber and although they collected feces they didn't measure it so i couldn't get that so basically the the rudimentary calculations i did showed a difference but i mean it's it's not accurate but this should be a way, should inspire some researchers to actually look at this because it just wouldn't be that hard to study. And I think we'd see some really good data. Now, when I started thinking about all this, I thought, okay, I'm going to go to the scientific literature and see what everybody says about it. And I was absolutely, absolutely flummoxed. I mean, I was gobsmacked because there was only one paper by this guy named R.N.C. B. Albite, whose name I noticed I just misspelled. There should be a C where that S is, who's a mathematics professor at the University of Puerto Rico. And his, his paper on this is totally mathematical. And uh, I used to be good at math because I was an engineer, but that ship has sailed. Uh, but that was the only paper that I found on this. Now, I have readers call me all the time or email me all the time and they ask me about some obscure herb or some weird supplement and I'll look it up on PubMed and there'll be 50 or 80 papers and I'll look up this which seems to me to be fundamental and there's one paper and it's theoretical and then I did some googling around and some searching and I found out that Ansi Manadin who is actually a, a sort of acquaintance of mine he used to comment on my blog and we went back and forth he had co-written a paper with with uh Arncibia albite they had a paper written together so i reached out to ansi since i knew him and said hey what's uh what's the deal going on with this and i got an email back from this i'm busy writing another paper uh, let's talk later and that was not that long ago and now he's got a new paper out that is on uh, is on prepub and he co-wrote the one he co-wrote with rncb albite is also on uh, uh on prepub and i've got those all listed in the table of coming I mean, in the in the sites i mean on my website on the address i gave you so now i guess it's time for um me to say thank you very much and i wait everybody lining up to throw tomatoes and stuff at me and there's the uh there's the site to go and get all these papers if you're interested so really thank you very much i appreciate your attention hey, hey mike that was just wonderful i loved it um i just wanted to add a comment uh, not as much a question it's interesting for me when you invoke this idea of mass reconciliation, and you think about the untreated type 1 diabetic who in the absence of insulin just begins wasting away, even in the midst of eating an abundance. Lots of calories. And lots of calories. And it's interesting to note, of course, they're excreting um, glucose, which is a mass itself. But even you note the hyperventilation that accompanies it. We always talk about how the patient's hyperventilate or the individual due to the acid-base reconciliation and the, the, uh, the, the, the respiratory compensation you know, of the ketoacidosis. And yet, I can't help but look at that through the lens of what you're presenting, that yes, hyperventilating allows them to improve pH, but at the same time, it becomes another way to get rid of a lot of CO2 that they just is accumulating in part um, because they can't stop burning fat, and that CO2 has to get out. Of course, they're also breathing out and urinating out a tremendous amount of ketone. Yeah. But even the hyperventilation is going to be getting rid of a lot of CO2, helping the body get rid of that mass that they can't keep because insulin is too low to let them. Yeah. Anyway, good point. I, I liked it. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thank you. My name is Alan Green, and um, definitely a lot of different paradigms for me to think about. I've, I've heard it said that you... The first, the first law of thermodynamics is when you're trying to solve for weight loss is um, you're trying to solve a physics problem when you really have a hormonal problem. <laughs> um, I know from my own journey, um, and I'm, I have a question. 
is um, I, the, the mass. I, so I, I guess my question is, do you lose, can you lose weight through um, generating heat? And the, the reason I asked that question is I was 425 pounds. I got all the way down to a thousand calories a day and I just simply got cold. When I was fat, I got hot. Um, and I've heard it explained that, well, your, your body is wanting equilibrium um, so when you eat too much, it's trying to burn some of it off. And when you don't eat enough, it's, so you have all these hormones counteracting that. So how does that tie in with the, well, the mass? And it may well theories? be that, that you're producing more heat because you're, you're with this whole excess energy thing that I talked about, but that's not why you lost weight. The reason you lost weight is because of the CO2 that you blew off, probably from breathing a little bit faster, for the water vapor that you breathed out, from the perspiration, uh, from those kind of things, because it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a mass situation. you got atoms, and you got to get rid of them, and they weigh, and energy doesn't. And energy is just a, sort of a secondary process. So is my body trying to save and conserve in those different areas? Yeah, well, if it's... I mean, if it's why does it happen? If you're releasing heat, I doubt that it's trying to conserve. I suspect that it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, I suspect that it's burning off. And when, and when the fat burns off to generate that heat, it's going to release carbon dioxide and water. And so uh, you, end up, you will end up having a weight loss. But it's not the heat that's causing you to lose weight. It's the atoms that you lose. Right. Mm -hmm. Hi. So I just, a question popped into my mind. Does this mean we should just cut back on our fluid intake if we wanted to lose weight? Cut back on what? Fluid intake. Stop uh, <laughs> drinking water or cut back there? No, well, water doesn't have any, it doesn't have any calories. And you're going to equilibrate with the water anyway, and you'll just pee it away. Um, so I don't think that cutting back on your fluid intake is going to make a big difference on that, although it is mass. And that's because all this is so, nobody's looked at this before, so nobody knows the answers to any of these questions, so it's just kind of a guess. But I would say that by cutting back on fluid intake, you probably wouldn't, gener I mean, you maybe generate some immediate weight loss if you didn't drink a glass of water, but uh, I don't think that you're going to generate, uh, you know, long-term weight loss just by cutting back on fluid consumption. Okay, thank you. Excellent talk. So my question is, uh, if you look into the sports medicine literature, there's the discussion that uh, fat oxidation is not as efficient and uh, requires more oxygen. So is the effect of a low carb diet maybe just that we require to breathe out more and breathe in less, or breathe in more and breathe out less? Well, <laughs> Yeah, you, you, you kind of breathe in more, I guess, and breathe out less because the RQ for low people on an all-fat diet is 0.7, so there's 0.7 as much carbon dioxide going out as there is oxygen coming in. That's called the respiratory quotient. Um, but I, you know, I don't... Uh, I believe it's like a 15% difference, right? Mm -hmm. From carbohydrate oxidation. Mm -hmm. Would that explain the weight loss? Uh, no, what explains the weight loss is you're losing more mass. And why you lose more mass, I mean, when you, when you take food in, you basically extract the energy from the food. You, you extract it from the, the chemical bonds in the food. And then you produce carbon dioxide and water. And you use the water to, uh, uh, you know, to create intercellular water in newly formed cells. You use the water for hydrolysis reactions. You use the carbon for carboxylase reactions, and then you get rid of what you don't need. And that's what's weird about the stoichiometry with these problems that I used to hate in biochemistry, where they would give you some giant molecule, and then you'd say, okay, they'd have O2 in and CO2, O2 out and CO2 out, and then you had to make it all balance. And so you would think it would just all come out easy, but it doesn't because all the, the reactants are not necessarily excreted. A lot of them are used. And so I don't know if that makes sense to you, but uh, a lot of the reactants are used in these stoichiometric equations. So it, it's not this perfect world like that. It always struck me, though, that inefficient uh, 
you know, if you're going to claim that it's inefficient for exercise, inefficiency sounds like an advantage metabolically to me. And it sounded like it fit nicely with your theories. Thanks. Good. Thank you for giving me a new way to look at all this. Um, <laughs> number one is nothing that you've introduced us to talks about energy partitioning and how that can be shifted in terms of, you know, minute changes between maintenance and growth and reproduction, et cetera. So that that's still there hormonally influenced. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, yeah, and I mean, Sorry. You, you know, you get rid of visceral fat, you, you do all kinds of things, but that's not the reason you lose weight. I mean, you right. improve Right, calories don't weigh is the tagline here. Uh, number two is Atwater had huge tables uh -huh. with many, 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 many different entries. And, you know, the ones that we typically talk about are kind of like approximations, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, so even that is right. an right. average, right. Right. right? right, yeah, exactly. Eric Westman, Durham, North Carolina. Thanks, Mike. I need to say that I'm not the one who's practiced low-carb keto diets the longest, maybe currently, but you and Mary Dan practiced, and if you add the years together, many more years than I have, so thank you. And, you know, you, um, again, you, you're blowing my mind. And the first calculation you did on your blog years ago that has changed my practice and, and the way I teach is the five grams of glucose in the bloodstream. Just There's just a teaspoon of sugar. And this, I think, is going to be as important as that calculation was. It seems very simple, but it's changing the discussion entirely from the caloric uh, uh, outside the body it being an explanation for a change yeah. in mass. I think that's brilliant, Mike. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. So, I mean, so you agree with this. I mean, it makes sense to you, right? It needs to be studied by Ben Bickman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, he's out there. It needs to be studied by, by Laura and Matt. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, oh, they're not in here either. How about any, how about Kevin Hall? Uh, Actually, I'd like to hear what Gary Taub said. No, I'd like to hear what Gary says about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. I think this is a very interesting and novel approach. I question how useful, though. Um, in thinking about carbohydrates, for example, cell, cell, uh, cell, uh, excuse me, cellulose is a carbohydrate. But you're not going to gain any weight eating cellulose. Well, you're going to temporarily gain weight. It's going to go out. But it's right. not going to, it's, it's metabolically for us, nothing right um you know also the effect of eating a pound of cake versus a pound of beef is obviously as we all know quite different mm -hmm. so i question how this is useful for people <laughs> oh <laughs> well uh you yeah i don't know how it's useful for the ranking i don't know uh, I mean, to me, it seems pretty profound. And that, uh, I mean, what I promised at the start is I was going to show you why you lose weight on a low carb diet. And that was, uh, I think that that's how, and that's where the weight loss goes. And as far as the implications, I don't know. I'm hoping that over time, people will look into this carefully and expand on it all. I know Ansi Maninen is. And, um, and so if, if some people, but he's like I am. He's just theoretical. So um, can I help out? I think this is extremely practical, extremely helpful, because you don't look at calories on the food. The calories don't weigh anything. Right. You, you look at grams of carbohydrates or grams of fat or grams of protein. Calories don't weigh anything. That's your message, right? Yeah. You, yeah. you put the, the, the I, I might have to repeat the whole thing for those who, <laughs> you, you, you put the hot water on the scale, the calories go down because it, it's less hot, and yet the weight hasn't changed. Yeah, no, that's yeah. true. So you don't look at the calories on the products. You look at the carb grams. Right. Is a that's practical... True advice yeah, from that. that's true that's true why didn't i think of that <laughs> hi 
Hi, I'm sorry, this thought's kind of incomplete, but it fits in with what some of the commenters were saying. So if we look at it, um, weight gain, so if you're, you know, that the weight gain has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. you, you don't get, you don't gain weight from the air, right? And like I said, I, this is an incomplete thought, um, just springboard, whatever. So, you know, you're eating veggies, you're not, get, you're not getting mass from them because it's cellulose, you know, like uh, another commenter said, it's cellulose, you send it right out. So, you know, it, I think it's a very helpful paradigm to think of for weight gain, because, um, you know, got to come from somewhere. Yeah, it has to, I mean, you know, an, an increase of, an increase of, an increase in, the fates are conspiring against me. An uh, increase in mass comes from an accumulation of mass, and a decrease in weight comes from a loss of mass, not a loss of energy. And the, the increase in weight doesn't come from an accumulation of energy, it comes from an accumulation of mass, and it's just gotta be that way.